some of you have read a little book uh, called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. In the um, preface to it, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Israel Spira says, there are events of such overbearing magnitude that one ought not to remember them all the time, but one must not forget them either. Such an event is the Holocaust. And for such a cause, we gather during this Holocaust Memorial Week and are fortunate on the Oregon State campus to have uh, many excellent speakers on this topic during the year. All of us have become aware and acquainted with the Holocaust to some level. We know that the emphasis of the last few years has been constantly for us to create a collective memory, a memory that would prevent other such events from happening. It's difficult to look around the world and perhaps confront the fact that our collective memory is not working. At the same time, however, we have individual memories and individual actions. Uh, and we, it's our hope in the committee as we put on the program each year that the message of the presenters will at least make an individual difference. And then in our small communities, we might make a collective difference for the future. Tonight, we're pleased to have Jacques Bergman here, a resident of Portland, Oregon, a survivor of nine slave and death camps uh, during uh, his 19th, 20th, 21st years of life. As an 18-year-old, he was uh, transported to the Netherlands in an effort by his parents to make things safe for him and his family was split up, uh, but uh, Hitler invaded Holland and, uh, and he was interred uh, until he was liberated from Bergen-Belsen in 1942. He came to America, had a brother who had been transported out earlier and uh, living in Portland. He went from New York to Portland where he has been uh, since 1947 working with the highway department, building scale models, engineering models for projects around the <coughs> western Oregon. Married with two daughters, uh, Mr. Bergman is our privileged speaker this evening because there are so few years left when we have living voices to talk to us about what the camps and the Nazi murder regime was like we are grateful that he has attended this evening. He'll speak for about 45 minutes and then take questions. Mr. Bergman. Thank you. <coughs> and, <coughs> and good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, when <coughs> When I drove down or up to Cavallis from uh, Portland, <coughs> I listened to the news, and uh, they were telling about Kosovo. <coughs> and deja vu. The only difference, uh, we as uh, survivors didn't have any cameras in the camp of photographers. Well, here's my story. This is a story about a 15-year-old boy. <coughs> Born in Vienna and went to school, played soccer, chased girls, uh, was in a choir, and then in 1938, in March of 1938, when Hitler marched in into Austria and took Austria or Vienna, 
everything came to, to a halt. I was transferred to a different school, to a Jewish school, different teachers, no more soccer and no more choir. And then <coughs> came Kristallnacht. You're probably familiar with this. And they all, the Nazis uh, sacked the synagogues and businesses, took the people out, the businessmen out in the street, gave them brushes to clean the street. Some had uh, toothbrushes to clean the street. So my parents and other parents um, got together with the uh, uh, official organization of, of Vienna, and they created a transport, a children transport, or a kinder transport, to either Holland or England. Well, I couldn't get on the England transport, so my parents put me on the uh, Holland transport. And then, uh, months later, after Kristallnacht on December the 10th of 1938, my parents and my aunt and uncle took me to the station. They put me on the train, not knowing I never see them again. I was 15 years old. <coughs> I got on the train, I came to Holland with some other hundred kids, the same uh, age or younger, and they put me in a group home in, in uh, Den Haag, and later on we moved to Rotterdam, <coughs> and I got a part-time job as a apprentice designer in the factory uh, for oriental works. I also went to school. I took some art classes. And then in 1940, in May 1940, Hitler invaded Holland. He bombed Rotterdam. They bombed us out. We had to leave. There were mostly about 60 young men and women, girls and boys. We had to leave. We were wandering around in Holland, finding to try to find a place to live. We finally wound up in Arnhem, which is very close to the uh, German border. There was an old castle there that once belonged to the royalty, and <clears throat> we made our home there. I again went to, uh, took some classes and uh, uh, some schooling, and also had a, a, a job with a, a firm, a small firm, who produced uh, uh, cutout figures, like uh, Disney figures, for decoration. And things started to happen very rapidly. Uh, restrictions appeared. We couldn't go to movies. We had to wear a yellow star, a big yellow star, which said Jod, or Jew in, in Dutch. And we couldn't go to, uh, to theaters, to a concert, or swimming. And we couldn't work for Christian families or Christian employees. So I lost my job. I got another job with a Jewish family, who were a young family who had two small children, and I became a butler uh, babysitter. And uh, <clears throat> one day the uh, uh, rumor got around that the Gestapo was picking up, which is the equivalent of the FBI here, to the Gestapo picking up uh, Jewish people and sending them somewhere. 
I didn't believe it first. And then when uh, I got home from the job in the group home, and sure enough, there was the Gestapo. And he asked me, do you live here? I said, yes. I said, pack your bag. So they took us to the station, and they took us to a camp in Westerbork called, <coughs> in, in Westerbork itself, which later on became a transit camp for the, for the Nazis for de deportation. Westerbork was originally a camp for uh, uh, refugees from Austria and Germany, and they didn't know the, the government didn't know what to do with them, and they didn't want them in Amsterdam or Rotterdam. They didn't want them, uh, for some reason, didn't want them there, so they put them in a camp. So they erected the camp, and when, when the Nazis walked into uh, Holland, they had a ready-made ready camp. So when I got to Westerwork, they uh, uh, put me on a job erecting some fences, some uh, uh, wire fences. And uh, since I know some people who were in that camp, because they were from either from Austria or from Germany, they, I got a job in, in the office as a, a, a office boy running uh, messages from one barrack to the other. And then when the uh, Nazis started deporting uh, people, bringing in uh, people from Amsterdam, Rotterdam, from Holland into Westerbork, and uh, each week the deportation started, and on Monday night, or Monday afternoon, the train came in, a cattle train came in, and uh, the list came out of the people who had to be on the train. And Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock, the train left for destination unknown. My job then became, every time the train came back from wherever it went to, to clean out the uh, cattle cars. And uh, <clears throat> when I cleaned out the, the cars, sometimes you would find a, a piece of paper or a, a scribble on the wall of the cattle car, a name of somebody who, le who left there or was riding on the train, or the name came up as Auschwitz and Birkenau. So from that, that time on, we knew that they were going to either Auschwitz or Birkenau, or Theresienstadt was another one. And so we knew where the people were going, but we had no idea what Auschwitz was. In Westerwork, we could uh, uh, wear our own clothes. We had our hair. The food was not bad. It was not good, but it was not bad. And we had, there was a black market going on. People came in from, from Holland, they had some food with them. So they were selling and trading food and cigarettes. So it wasn't too bad. We couldn't go anywhere. <clears throat> but one day, the list came out on Monday afternoon. My name was on it. I had no choice. Uh, the next morning, they gave us some food. They put us on the train. I had a little rucksack with my few clothing and my uh, anything. I had uh, pictures of my parents, my brother, and uh, we left. They sealed up the cattle train, the cattle cars, and we left. Two days later, the train stopped. <coughs> they opened up the doors, and there was a sea. We looked out. There was a sea of Nazi uniforms with uh, uh, bayonets, rifles, dogs, shepherds, German shepherds. 
and people in striped uniform. And we were at loss. We had no idea who those people were. So they chased us out. They uh, uh, filed us in a single file. And then a Nazi would come along, an assessment would come along, and he would uh, ask you to give him the, if you had a nice jacket, a nice boot, to give it to him, or if you had some jewelry, to give it, he had to give it to him. Then we filed in a single file, they separated the women, the men, and the children. We filed in a single file into a barrack. <coughs> there they took away all our belongings. Uh, all the jewelry, if you had any. And there were, when you got into the barrack, there were three Nazis standing in front of a table. And the guy in the middle was pointing his finger either to my left or to my right. Meaning, if you pointed to the left, you went into a labor camp. If you were pointing to the right, you went to a gas chamber. <coughs> in the back of that uh, table, there's a, a, a wall there, and there were some handicapped, mentally handicapped, and uh, people sitting, kids, uh, adults, they were moaning, they were crying, they were talking, and to my right, the door opened, and every time the door opened, they shoved them in. And you saw a few of those black shower heads. When I became, came before the uh, three Nazis, it took only a split second. He pointed the finger to my left. I went to my left <coughs> into a barrack. They stopped me. They shaved all the body hair. We took a hot shower, no soap, no towels. They chased us out again. They chased us in that different barrack. And we again had to line up in a single file. And at the end of the barrack, there were several people standing, and they were giving a tattoo number on your left arm. I don't know if you can see it for me or not. From this moment on, you lost your identity. All you knew was your number. You had to answer by the number. You had to, every time somebody spoke to you, you had to answer with that number. It was the identity. identity. We were chased again, and, uh, by the, and with that number on your arm, they also gave you a small uh, white cloth with your number on it, and next to it, if you were Jewish, there was a stair, uh, uh, Star of David in yellow. If, uh, for example, a uh, number with a triangle, either a red triangle was for political uh, prisoners, a green triangle was for uh, murderers, thieves, and felons, a uh, violet triangle was for the for the clergy. A black triangle was for the gypsies and non desirables, and a pink triangle was for the homosexuals. So we are marked with a yellow star and a number. They sewed that number on on a closing, striped closing. Now we knew why, why those people were striped clothing. A shirt, a jacket, a pair of pants. We kept our uh, belt. 
and we're going to head. And uh, they saw down the, the number. And they gave us two pieces of cloth that uh, the size of a big, big hang handkerchief instead of socks. We had to wrap our feet in it. And then some shoes that didn't belong to us. They took it away about several hours ago. Uh, some shoes, some of the outside shoes didn't fit. Then they still no food or water or anything. Then they chased us in another barrack. We stayed there overnight. And this was Burkina. Next morning, <coughs> they marched us. They marched us out to Auschwitz, Auschwitz proper. Uh, brick buildings, tile roof, they looked like blocks. And they put us in block 11. Block 11, as it turned out to be, was a experiment block for men. Next door was block 10 which was an experiment, a medical experiment block for women. They put us in a huge cell, all concrete. They stopped the killing when we got there. They stopped it two weeks before. We, we, we heard later. A huge cell, concrete cell, had an opening about that big, no glass was open. Uh, no straw in it, no uh, blankets, and against the, the, and the back wall, there was a trough. So what the Nazis did, they used uh, revolvers and put silences on them, and they shot the prisoners because they wanted to know how they react. And after they were done, they shoveled him out, they, they hosed off the, 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 the cell, and you still could see some blood against the wall in the back. We stayed there about for five days. And just before the last day, I was standing by the window, and the, I heard a voice coming across, and, and it came from block 10. And there was a girl standing there, I had to closing on, had a closing, had her hair, and she recognized me. And she called over and she said, I'm in block 10 in the me medical experiment block, and I'll tell you more about, about it in the morning. And then she disappeared. Apparently there was some, some Nazis standing there. But unfortunately the morning they shipped us out, so I had never, never had a chance to talk to her again. They shipped us out, they put us in a truck, they took us to a camp called Molovitz, or Buna. Buna was run by IG Farm, huge factory. They were experimenting with uh, synthetic rubber. And the irony of the whole thing is that they never produced one ounce of synthetic rubber. But each morning, the prisoners were marching out the, the, the camp. And by the gate, there was a music, a band, playing music, march music. In the evening, they were bringing back the dead ones and the sick people. And I didn't work in there. I didn't, I was lucky I didn't work in that factory. They gave me a job to clean up the camp. They gave me a stick to clean up the paper and the debris and uh, on the grass and on the, uh, 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 side box, uh, 
but mostly gravel. I stayed there for about three weeks, and then one day, a um, Nazi guy, a Nazi officer, with three capos appeared, and they selected people out of the barrack. Uh, those three guys were capos, and let me explain what a capo is. A capo is a foreman or an overseer. The Germans spelled it with a K, K-A-P-O, the, the Latin word for it is C-A-P-O. And they ran the camps. They had some work capos. They had some uh, capos for the inside, for the outside, for, for a detailed capo, for the, for the kitchen, you name it. But those three main capos, one was called the oldest, because he was the head of the, ca the capos and, and of the camp. He got the instruction from, from the Nazis. And then was the office capo, and the, the third one was the uh, uh, personal butler to uh, the c commander. The uh, oldest capo was a murderer. One day he uh, told me that uh, how he hacked his wife uh, when, uh, because he was enraged for something. He hacked his wife. He killed her. The uh, office capo was an accountant. He, uh, the, uh, the irony was that he was working for a Jewish employee before the Nazis came, and he was embezzle, embezzling some money from the employee, and then he put him in, the, in, the, in, in jail. And the third one was a thief. He used to steal uh, automats. He used to break him open and steal automats. Those coppers and the camp. They put us on a truck. They took us to a factory. The factory was producing anti-aircraft guns for the Wehrmacht, for the military. It was an enclosed factory. It had a huge courtyard, a, uh, a wall about 12 feet high, a brick wall, had uh, a, a wire, an electric wire on top of it. There was a huge hall where we all slept on bunk beds and straw mattresses, no, no blankets. And the factory was in that compound. So when we got there, they lined us up, and the uh, office couple came along and said, anybody knows how to make a sign. Now, he never volunteered for anything. In Monowitz, for example, uh, two guys volunteered. They were asking for somebody who can type. And they volunteered, and I never saw him again. So he didn't volunteer. So, but two guys volunteered. They were two French guys. And the capo took him to the office, and an hour later he came back, both of them, and he behind him and yelling and screaming and carrying on, and I've never seen anything like it. You can't draw a line, why did you volunteer? Uh, you idiots. And he kept going and going. So I don't know what possessed me. I had some art. I did some, some science before. And I volunteered. And he said, you better know what you're doing. So he took me to an office. And he sat me down, and he gave me a pencil and a, and a brush that had about three hairs on it and some red paint. And I made a sign that says, beware electric fence. Never, never in my life was I so particular.
to make that sign. Because I didn't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> I finished it. He took it into the commander. He liked it. And I had a job. I made signs. I worked in the office. I was an office boy. And then I made greeting cards for the SS, for the commander, for uh, customers, any holiday, birthdays. The commander had a, a uh, uh, mistress in camp, but he had a, a wife and two children in Germany. And I made uh, cards. He never gave the instructions to me, never. He never spoke to me. He always gave the instructions to the office couple. And apparently, he liked it, and I kept doing it. And I was grateful, because the Nazis left me alone. And that's probably why I'm standing here today. Uh, our daily ration was a enameled bowl about that big, about that high. And we got a liter soup consisting of rotten potatoes, turnips, uh, hot water, and sometimes we find some we found some uh, meat in it. Uh, don't ask me what kind of meat meat. I suspect it was horse meat. And each noon, the people came in from the factory. <clears throat> they gave us uh, some soup and a piece of bread, uh, like a quarter of a French bread, and maybe some marmalade that was made of red beets. And you had a choice. You could eat the whole thing and go hungry for the next 24 hours, or you ate the soup, and you took your bread and put it between your jacket and your, your shirt, because you couldn't put it in your pocket. But during the night, we didn't have any blankets. We slept in our jackets. The uh, bunk beds, the, the room between the bunk beds was maybe a foot between the bunk beds. Uh, there were three, uh, three bunk beds on top of each other. And during the night, somebody would come along and just reach over and steal your bread. But when you kept it between your, uh, between your jacket, jacket and your, your shirt, at least during the night you can nibble on it because you got very hungry. And that went on for several, several, several months. As a matter of fact, it was nine months I stayed in that camp. And one day we heard the uh, cannons going off. We were shooting. We heard some planes going over. And we knew that the Russians had an offensive against the Germans because we, we heard rumors. And we also had the, uh, the, the gate had some assessment in there, and they had a radio. And every time they made an announcement on the radio in German, and they played music, and uh, every hour seems like it, they had a, uh, an announcement that the Germans were victory, uh, victorious, and they were going against the Russian. And they kept uh, saying the names of the Polish villages and the towns they were capturing. And some of the Polish uh, prisoners, they were listening to that, said, wait a minute. They're not going forward. They're retreating. So we knew that they were going towards us. They were coming towards us. So we were full of hope. Maybe we are going to be liberated. Bad chance. Next morning, 
uh, they packed us up. They put us on a cattle train, 80 to 100 people in a cattle car. And you have to remember that those cattle cars were about the half, half the size what you see here, not those long ones. They're about half the size. So all you had room and no food and no, no water, and they gave us a bucket for a toilet. And you had to, the only, you had no room, you only could stand. And you st stood like this. He had no place to move unless somebody fell down and you had a little bit of room. And there was one prisoner in there. Somebody stole his bread. He saved up his last meal. He saved up. We got in camp. Somebody stole it. And he went berserk. He went screaming and crying. They sealed the, the cars up, and after two days, we stopped, and we stopped in Vienna on a sidetrack. And at that time, the, we were going west, and the military trains were going east. They had priority. So every time a military train came, they put us on the side, and they let the military train go by. So we inched forward a little bit at the time. And you have to remember that at that time, they had the steam engines. And those steam engines had, had to have water. So they had water towers. So when our cattle car came before one of those water towers, there was a guy standing on top of it. And the cattle car, and this was in January of 1945. So when we came in front of that tower, the, the cattle car had two openings on each side. There were some slats in front of it. So we shoved a bowl through those slats, and we begged for water, and he he refused, and he thought we were murderers, because with all the striped uniforms, he thought we were murderers. So he refused. But there was some snow on top of the uh, cattle uh, uh, car. We could, to the slats, we could reach up, and we grabbed some snow, and which was a mistake because the snow tasted salty, so we got more thirsty. No food, no water. Uh, one time we stopped. We uh, got another sidecar, a military train came by. Behind us was a, also a prison train, but with open cars, not closed, open. And this was winter. The train passed, the military train passed. We started going too. And we saw the airplanes coming. And they bombed the uh, military train and the other prison train, train at the same time. Next time, when after two days, took two days from Vienna. We stopped in what they called Mauthausen. Mauthausen was a former quarry. And when the Nazis marched in into Vienna in May, they built that camp, Mauthausen, first as a political uh, prison camp. Mauthausen had the distinction, since it was a quarry, of uh, 
building 186 steps up on a hill. And what they did, the Nazis did, they marched the prisoners, eight to a column, up those hill, that hill, those steps. They were uneven steps. When they got to the top, there were some Nazis sitting there. And every time the prisoners came before them, they were smoking, they were drinking, they were, they were uh, drunk. Each time uh, a prisoner came before him, they shoved the prisoner down, and they were yelling another parachute coming. When we marched by those steps, when we got in, we marched by those steps. There were a few stragglers going up. I never saw the column of prisoners they told me were going up there. They put us in a barrack. And they stripped us. They took away all the clothing. They stripped us completely. They shaved our uh, body hair again. They gave us a hot shower, the first one over a year. No towels, no, no soap again. And they chased us out. It was cold. There was snow on the ground. It was freezing. When we got out of the shower, the water just froze on our body. We had to up, uh, line up in a single file again, marched into a barrack. When we got inside the barrack, in the back of it, there were three Nazis standing there with a huge lamp. They were looking for lice. After you took your shower, they were looking for lice. If they found one louse on your body, they looked in every opening of your body. If they found one louse, next morning you were seen hanging from the rafters. We stayed there overnight. Next morning they marched us down to a satellite camp called Gusen. I don't know if it was Gusen 1, 2, or 3, which is about 3 kilometers from Mauthausen. And there, they started in the same procedure again. Mauthausen, <coughs> let me describe Mauthausen. <coughs> I don't want to take away anything from Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen. Uh, I've been in both of them. Uh, Mauthausen was a free for all. They froze you to death, they shot you, <coughs> they hang you, they throw you from the, from the uh, mountain. Anything went. There was no rhyme or reason. At, it was winter. The, what struck me was the absence of noise and color. It was absolutely gray and black. The snow was dirty. There was no noise. You couldn't hear the boots of the Nazis. You couldn't hear a door slam or uh, something drop. Nothing. And no voice was heard, absolutely still. If anybody asks you what hell is look like, it's not hot. It's cold, it's miserable, it's gray, it is dark, it is black. When we got to, we stayed in Gusen for five days. Then they packed us up again in a cattle car, again the same number. This time, uh, no bucket for a toilet, no food, no water. Two days. One day uh, during the night, we stopped in Dresden. The uh, prisoners of uh, Dresden came out 
and he gave us a package of dried noodles to eat. We went on and we stopped. The next stop was Hanover. In the meantime, the Nazis transferred the factory from where we were, that was called Lauerhütte. I don't know what the uh, Polish name for that uh, factory was, but it was called in German Lauerhütte. Uh, they transferred the factory from Lauerhütte to Hanover. When we got to Hanover, some people, when we opened up the door, some people died in the meantime. We stepped over them. We marched for about five kilometers into a new, not a, a new camp, it was an abandoned camp. Uh, somebody was in there before. And next morning we marched down to the factory where they had the same setup that they had in, the, in Poland. This time I lost my job. I couldn't work in the, in the office anymore. And they put me in the factory. They put me on a machine that uh, uh, had a diamond cut on it, and it was broken, and it didn't work. So if you stand there all day, you had nothing to do, and every time a capo or foreman came along, you took a, a, a piece of cloth and wiped up the, uh, the machine, and you have nothing to do, and all these thoughts go to food. So what I did, I took my, my belt, and I was so hungry, I was chewing on them. I chewed on my belt just to, kept, to keep my uh, juices going. And this went on for three weeks. And then one day, we heard bombs going over and they started bombing Hanover. And sure enough, they told us when we got home, when we got back to the, to the, from the factory to the, to the camp, that they called us, told us we were gonna leave in the morning. In the meantime, we had to dig a hole, huge hole. They emptied out the second barrack. We had some sick people in there. I had a friend in there. They emptied it out. They lined him up in front of the hole. They shot him up. They shot him. We threw him in. We covered up the hole. And next morning, we walked out. We started marching. We started marching towards Sally, which is not very far from Bergen-Belsen. We heard of the camp Bergen-Belsen. So we started marching. And on the way, we uh, went to a small village. There were some German women standing out there with a pitcher of a uh, glass pitcher of water in it. And they tried to give us the water, and the Nazis just threw the pitches away. At night, it was a two-day march. At night, we stopped in a barn. It was very dark, it started to rain. It was dark inside the barn. They pushed us in there, and we were groping towards the wall against, we had, we were holding, we, our friends had uh, three friends left. We were holding on to each other. We were against the wall in the back and tried to sit down or tried to lie down or whatever. And during the night, they opened up the door, the Nazis opened up the door and they emptied the rifles. And in the morning, we marched out, blood all over, people still screaming, whining, some are dead, some are half dead. We stepped over them, we started marching, and we started marching towards Bergen-Belsen. 
when we got into bergen Belsen, it was unbelievable. There's thousands, and I mean thousands and thousands of people milling around, sitting on the ground, walking on, some of dead people on the, on, the, on the walkways. And they put us in the barrack. It was dark, but then again, in the morning, we made our way and we camped out. A couple grabbed me. He gave me a string about six feet long. I had to tie it on, on, those, uh, on dead people. I managed only two to take those dead people and threw them in a mass grave. Some of the people who were in the mass grave, they were half dead. Some of them were still alive, alive in there. Uh, since by that time, I had no shirt, no jacket, only a pair of pants. I looked like everybody else. We all looked alike. I had one shoe, so the cop didn't find me anymore. So we made camp outside in, in one of those uh, ditches in, in camp there. And after five days, it got very quiet. We heard some shooting before. After five days, it got very quiet. And the English marched in. A loudspeaker said, please do not leave that camp because we, th we know that, that you might be diseased and we give you some food. They gave us some K rations. They gave us some cigarettes. They refused to light, but no matches. They refused to light the cigarettes because they were afraid that they, whatever we had, would, they would catch. So they finally we got a light for cigarettes. At that time, cigarettes stopped your hunger. That's why we smoked. There was, there was more people would trade in a, a piece of bread for a cigarette because it stopped the hunger. And I became very weak. I couldn't walk anymore. I, I crawled. And uh, one day, uh, I think it was the second day, or the second or third day, I saw a Red Cross uh, uh, ambulance stopping in front of the barrack and not about 50 feet away from where we were hiding or we staying there. In the meantime, just one day before the liberation, one friend died next to me. And uh, his words were, I would like to see the liberation, but it never came to pass. So there were just two of us left. And I saw that Red Cross, and I said to my friend, I'm going over there. So I called over. I had to, uh, a ditch about maybe three feet deep, high. Called over. It took me a half a day to get there. The Red Cross <coughs> put me on a stretcher. They took me to a cleaning station. It was covered with lice from top to bottom. Uh, they cleaned me up. They put some powders on me. Again, they put me on the stretcher, <coughs> and I passed out. <coughs> A week later, I woke up. I had no idea what happened to me. I woke up in a room, it was white, <coughs> it was a, a glass window, sunshine, it was blue, blue outside. There were no tubes sticking out of my anywhere. How they kept me alive to this day, I do not know. They gave me some food, they gave me some cigarettes. I tried to eat and I couldn't, but couldn't hold it down. I threw it up again. I couldn't eat. And 
I stayed there for two weeks. And one day the Red Cross came in, asked me where I was from. I told them and they said, okay, let's go. They put me in a stretcher, they put me in a Red Cross truck, and they took me back to Holland. On the way we stopped in a farm, and there were some other prisoners in that same transport, <coughs> and they brought me some marvelous, marvelous food, and I couldn't eat it. I brought it back up again. They took me back to Holland, they put me in a hospital, and after a few days, I had a pain in my left leg. It turned out to be I had thrombosis, a clotting of my artery in one leg. At that time, they didn't have any any medicine to uh, uh, to give to me. The only thing they had was aspirin, not knowing that aspirin was a uh, clotting uh, dissolver. Uh, I had kept my food up. They gave me milk and cereal to eat. That's all I could eat. That's all I could keep down. And after three weeks, I saw that I was cured. I got another pain in my right leg. I got thrombosis on the other side, another three weeks. So finally, I was well enough. They released me. They gave me some money for car fare. They gave me some clothes. I had no clothes. I had nothing. I didn't have any pictures anymore, nothing. They took everything away from me. I went back to Arnhem, and I, in the meantime, when I was in the hospital, the lady I was working for before I went into the camps was the young uh, family that had us two children, and she was sent to a concentration camp, so was her, fa so was her husband. He died. She came back. She was in Raven Ravensbrück. She came back and she was looking for her children because she managed to get her children into her, uh, some uh, farmhouses before she left for camp. And she was looking for her children in Holland and in Belgium. And she stopped by the hospital and she said, when, you, when you're well and you come, come and uh, stay with us. Well, I got back to Arnhem. I got to the house to the address she gave me, and there was nobody there. And there was a neighbor lady. <coughs> she saw me standing there, and she came over and I told her who I was. She said, well, I have a key. I let you in. And she gave me, she prepared some food for me. She let me in. And later on, after a week or two, the friend came back, finally came back. I started to recuperate. I had to learn how to walk again, completely. I got a job in a bank, and uh, the Red Cross one day uh, gave me a letter that was a stamped Guam. <coughs> uh, no, it stamped Portland. And in a translated from German in, in, into English letter, uh, uh, whoever wrote that letter was my paternal, my sister-in-law. I had no idea that my brother, in the meantime, got married. He was in Portland. And uh, then uh, I got connected with my brother, who was in, the who was in Guam in the military, and uh, I got an affidavit to come to the United States. And in 1947, I came first to New York, and then to Portland, and I've been there ever since. Now, the reason I 
telling the story. Apparently, I haven't learned very much. I remember <coughs> reading about and seeing about Kozakov. Uh, so it won't happen again to anybody, but it does. Unfortunately, it does. It's happening again. I wish we could blow away our hate, the hate that's out there, the hate for other people. It's too bad we can't be tolerant. Doesn't matter what religion you are, what philosophy you have, what political aspiration you have. Doesn't matter. As long as we're tolerant. As long as we respect the humankind, respect other people, let's ne never, never take away the right as a human being, as a citizen. We might disagree, we cannot love everybody, we cannot embrace Im everybody, it's impossible. But at least we can be tolerant towards other people. It's unfortunate that it happens again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. several times. Uh, I've come back to Vienna once because I want to find out what happened to my parents. And what I did find in Vienna is that they were deported to Minsk in Russia. And when they got there, they were murdered. And what happened to my uncles, cousins, aunts, I have no idea. I know two cousins, two cousins who were the same age as uh, my brother and I. They beautiful young girls. They were selected for prostitution. And after two years, they were, uh, they uh, had TB, they died. No, I know s several survivors go back to uh, Auschwitz and Bergenberg and whatever, Mauthausen. You couldn't pay me to go back. You couldn't pay me. I was brought up, <coughs> uh, I was in a, in, a, in a choir. So every week uh, I went to the synagogue and, and singing in the choir. So I used to learn a, uh, Hebrew and all that. Uh, my parents, um, once in a while, they used to uh, observe uh, some holidays. So I, I know a little bit about it. I think I was sent once to a Hebrew school, probably took me out because I couldn't, <laughs> I didn't understand it, I didn't read it. When I got into Westerbork, 
everything went blank. There is no God. Nobody can do this to other people. And I was not alone. When we got to Auschwitz, I was not alone. And I never got, got it back. I don't believe in it. I really do not believe in it. Nobody can do this to other people. Look, where is, he, where is he now in Yugoslavia? Where is he if there is one? Yes, sir. Almost every day. It, uh, it never left me. Uh, there's always a, uh, a newspaper article, a TV show, a movie, or doesn't matter what you're reminded of, and everything comes back again. I haven't spoken about this for 40 years. In uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, I don't know if you remember anybody here, there was a, an exhibit in Portland, the uh, Anne Frank exhibit. And uh, I was asked to speak about my experience. I was a little bit reluctant. And uh, at the same time, a guy from England, by the name of Irving, a Holocaust denier, came to Portland and spoke to a group of, of uh, Nazis there. And I got mad. So I, I told whoever was in charge of the, of the exhibit, sign me up. And from that moment on, I spoke. I speak to eighth graders to high school and people like you and colleges, whatever. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. to put it out of my mind completely. But I, I wasn't very successful, but like I said, uh, not the first year, first four years. Nobody want, the reason I didn't talk about it, because nobody wanted to hear about it. <coughs> you know, people came back from the war, they were busy with their own lives, they didn't want to uh, listen to horror stories, they didn't want to listen to the, the Holocaust. They weren't, uh, most of them people weren't even aware of it. So I kept quiet. So I tried to keep it out of my mind and tried to make a start from the beginning, try to make a living, try to do something with, with my life. Were you huh? angry at the American people? Uh, I'm angry now. I wasn't angry then, but I'm, sometimes I'm angry now because America did very little, very little. It's coming out now, but they didn't do anything about the solution. Look at uh, the ship St. Louis was sent back to, to uh, England. You had to have affidavits in order to get to the United States. Now you just walk over the border. That's hard to take. Yes. Go ahead. Did I have 
have a normal childhood? No. No. I had it before the Nazis came in, yeah. I did all the things that a, uh, a young boy does, you know. But uh, afterwards, I lost my youth. Uh, the good years and between 16 and 22, that's gone, unfortunately. Yes? I still do, yeah. I still do. I still. My brother had some pictures. I they, I, they took away my pictures, all, all of it. My brother had some pictures, so I know what they, what they look like. Yeah. <coughs> yes. I'm sorry, my hearing is going. <laughs> he wonders if you've he heard or knew of Oscar Schindler. No, no, no. I never heard of it until the until the book came out, until the movie came out. I read the book and then uh, saw the movie. No, I never heard of it. I never uh, wasn't aware of it. Neither was I aware that Anne Frank was in Bourbon Bells, and she died a month before I got there. I, I get that question, did you know Anne Frank, but <laughs> no, I didn't know her either. She wasn't very famous then either. Yes, sir. Now I understand. Um, I don't know what justice. Come on. Um, you know the, the the funny part. Well, it's not funny that the uh, the factories paid the Germans, paid, paid the Nazis for each labor between four and five marks a day. They paid him for it. They, uh, they paid for everything. Even the, the uh, people who got transported, deported, they had to pay the railroad, uh, made up tickets. They had to pay for that on paper. So everybody worked for the Nazis, everybody. The farmer grew those rotten potatoes, the railroad, the people who built the uh, ovens, they're making beer now, the same people. Everybody got paid. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever wanted to get rid of the tattoo in your arm? Have a what? Running? Wanted to get rid of your tattoo? No. No. Why? It's an, uh, sort of a socially good, you know. <laughs> I got all the life. Yes, sir. Soldiers who liberated you feel when they oh, saw you? I don't know. I never talked to them. I never could speak to them. I don't know. The only thing I know, they, uh, we tried to get some some light for the cigarettes, they, but they refused. So that's all. I never, never spoke to them. Yes? Can you guess about how much you weighed at the time you were 
when I got to Holland, they weighed me. It was 80 pounds. We have one more question before we have to close. Have you, have you spoken with your own children about your experiences? Uh, I have one, one child who is a mentally handicapped. She wouldn't understand. Uh, the other one, uh, my youngest daughter, yes, she, she knows about it. Yeah. I also, I should say my wife, I told it to my wife. This is the only one I told it after I got married. I, didn't, I never took, uh, told it to my brother what happened to me until uh, fairly recently. But I told it to my wife and she wrote it down. And uh, I have a manuscript now. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.